Two years ago, Svea Nihus was unable to walk. A childhood congenital problem had affected her central nervous system, and specialists had ruled that the prospects of rehabilitation were slim. Okay, Svea, so what changed? Svea began swimming with dolphins. And almost immediately, she started to recover. So too did lots of other children with disabilities. Something is happening, definitely. Even though there is no real explanation, but there is something happening. These animals recognize that they have a job to do, a very special job, and a job that gives them enormous pleasure. So what is happening? Do the animals sense something we don't understand? Is a miracle taking place? My brain says there's no magic. My heart says it's absolutely magical. Ahead, the growing number of cases where animals, through one means or another, are actively helping sick and disabled patients. We look at the case of Jan Pike, suffering from cerebral palsy, and yet so invigorated by riding a horse that she's entering a world riding championship for the disabled. So inspiring is this contest that riders include the visually impaired and physically handicapped. Refrigerator. There's the assistance dogs, trained not only to guide their disabled patients, but also to help around the house and activate telephone systems in times of emergency. And there's the therapy animals that have proved to have beneficial results with patients. As for the visually impaired, Jo Weir feels such benefits from her association with animals that she's begun running her own stud for alpacas. In itself, it's an inspirational story. And yet looked at in association with other cases, it begs the question, what miracles are taking place when disabled and blind men and women interact with animals? Only now, only really I'd say in the last 10 years, have we suddenly awakened to the fact, oh my God, these animals that share the planet with us are in some ways our superior when it comes to feeling deep emotions. That is a miracle. Yeah, dig it. Miracles from the Wild Side is indeed a heartwarming and challenging program charged with emotion. But it will improve a lot and we're very thankful for what happened here. And we try to come back, definitely. What is it about animals that enthralls audiences so much? SeaWorld's 10-ton Shamu has the crowd screaming with delight. These animals are so fantastic that they can put a smile on just about anyone's face on any given day. Over in Britain, a performance at the Spirit of the Horse has crowds captivated. And at Sydney's Taronga Zoo, tourists are turned on by an assortment of creatures. People get really excited and they walk away going, oh my God, oh, I just touched a seal. And, it, it, you know, it's a quite a powerful feel to have been that close to a wild animal. It's a proven fact that animals make us feel good. Their unconditional love lets us express ourselves freely. But what is only just emerging is how powerful an effect animals can have on humans. The extraordinary thing is that all these animals, horses and dolphins and cats and dogs, have had a certain capacity for their entire history, for thousands of years that they've been interacting with humans, and we have not recognized it. We did not realize that they can feel pity for us that they can feel compassion for us, that they can demonstrate this. It's been there all along, and we've been blind. That's your boy. Jeffrey Mason is a psychoanalyst who's been studying and writing best-selling novels about animals. 
he's convinced that animals are not only great therapy for all of us, but their powers are such they can help cure the sick. I think that animals like Astro help people who have been ill to recover because they remind them of the deep importance of emotions. Oh, I have absolutely no doubt that animals can help us recover. Just what forces are at play, we're about to explore as we look at a wide range of cases where the health of sick and disabled people has improved dramatically after interacting with animals. Take a swim in the warm waters off Hawaii and chances are you'll be rewarded by an encounter with dolphins. For tourists, it's a thrill. Up close and personal with a creature renowned for its sensitivity and intelligence. These characteristics are exactly why dolphins have been chosen to help people with disabilities. An hour's drive south of Miami, Florida, the small settlement of Key Largo is home to a program known as Dolphin Human Therapy. From all over the world, youngsters with problems as diverse as autism to cerebral palsy are being exposed to a form of treatment that is having remarkable results. The key are these Atlantic bottlenose dolphins. What we're trying to do is increase the attention span of the kids, get them to focus. Dr. David Nathanson is the guru of dolphin therapy, having treated almost 4,000 youngsters from 60 countries at his Florida center. So we use interaction with the dolphins as a reward, and the children's fo children focus longer, they learn faster, and in a sense, not just in a theoretical sense, but in a real sense, they're improving rapidly, they're less handicapped. Typical of the youngsters that Dr. Nathanson and his therapist help is 14-year-old Svea Nihus. Svea has been afflicted with a condition known as microcephaly, a congenital anomaly of the central nervous system. Such was its effect that Svea was unable to walk. You couldn't do that like two years ago. That was until her parents flew her from their home in Germany to this center in Florida. After just one week of therapy with the dolphins, Svea began to make real improvements with both her speech and her mobility. When she came here for the first time, she couldn't walk independently and she couldn't make as many sounds and she, she really developed so great, so I'm very proud of her. Svea's therapist, Stephanie, worked with her the first time she was here and has now resumed therapy. And Svea's mother, Kirsten, has watched the girl she calls Our Sunshine make significant improvements. Before, nobody find a way to her. She couldn't tell us what she wanted to do. She couldn't speak about this. She has no speech to do it. And then she find the way. The way she found was this treatment. Surrounded by a team of therapists and dolphin trainers, Svea is given a series of mental challenges. Concentrate enough and respond positively. And Svea is rewarded by being allowed to swim with a dolphin known as Spunky. Something miraculous happens when they get into the water with those dolphins. And the strange thing is, the dolphins seem to recognize these kids need help. What follows are a series of exercises where Svea and Spunky interact. First, there's the hoop held by Svea to allow the dolphin to swim through. Then Spunky brings Svea a kickboard before pushing her and Stephanie around the enclosure. Next, a ball is introduced, and once more dolphin and patient get on famously. What the handlers have found time and again is that the dolphins are always much more sensitive and understanding when it comes to handling youngsters like Svea. They're able to make up their own games with the kids, to do things to make sure that their own attention is sustained, which is much more difficult to do with other animals, and there's much more of a variety of rewards and interactions that you can do with the dolphins. Around and around, Svea and trainer Stephanie spin, matched perfectly by Spunky. It fascinates them and it calls forth in them some kind of pity, some kind of sympathy, some form of empathy, of compassion. They want to help these children. 
They don't do this because you're feeding them. They do it because they feel that these kids need them. After 40 minutes, Spunky brings the session to a close with a vigorous splash. Svea is invigorated by the session, so much so that she mischievously grabs the cover off our microphone. For trainer Stephanie, Svea's response is a joy to behold. He did marvelous, very, very good. And so I think it's also important that, you know, that she is able to show her skills much better now. It's proof, she says, of Svea's improvements, with the dolphin playing a very special role. I think they always approach the child in the, in the perfect way. It's, I can't explain to you why it happens, but it just does. And it's very special to watch and to trust in it, too. Next to be treated today is Lucas. This six-year-old from Austria is suffering from cerebral palsy and is about to share the water with a dolphin known as Kimbit and his trainer, Cynthia. Kimbit is a really sweet, gentle dolphin. He's also uh, very enthusiastic and, and a bit hyper. He's nine years old, he's a nine-year-old male. Um, but when he gets around Lucas, he just gets really gentle and slows down and you know, looks at him a lot to see what's going on in his face. And it's really neat to see them together. As with Svea, Lucas's first task in the water is to complete some exercises while Kimbert patrols close behind him. Then the reward, with Lucas encouraged to touch Kimbert. The next encounter demonstrates just how sensitive the dolphin is to his patient. Kimbert nudges up to Lucas ever so gently and Lucas responds instantly. I think you could call it intuition. Yeah, yeah, Kimbit definitely reads the situation and reads the people he's working with. And, and, um, and in Lucas's case, he just was really sweet, playful but sweet. Yeah, and that was perfect for Lucas. Throughout the session, it's hard to tell whose smile is the biggest, Lucas or Kimbit's. They have definitely bonded, according to Lucas's father, Johannes. Actually, I heard that, that, this, that Lucas is the first uh, child uh, for Kimbit here in dolphin human therapy. Uh, and they fell in love with each other. Uh, Lucas can't even wait in the morning to come to Kimbit. And as we all have the impression that dolphins love, uh, we think that Kimbit also enjoys it. But there's far more than happiness being generated here today. there are discernible signs that the interaction is really working. Some of the things that we saw with Lucas was that his ability to hold on to Kimbit's fin um, improved over time. So in the beginning, he just sort of had his hand on his side, and by the end, he was really holding on. Um, so I would say Kimbit probably does see that, yeah. It's amazing, actually. Uh, when we came here, uh, I, actually, I didn't believe that an animal could, could improve uh, the self-confidence and the motorics of a child. But what really happened was uh, the attention of Lucas increased dramatically. That means he concentrates much longer now. Uh, and his motorics, he tries to stand up, which is, which is really a miracle for us because he sits in the wheelchair and he never tried to get up the last six years. And now after two weeks with the animal, with the dolphin, he tries to stand up. And that's, that's the miracle for me. Similar results are being witnessed with Sebastian. This 10-year-old Austrian boy suffers from muscular atrophy, a condition that Alphonse the dolphin has been enlisted to work on. The dolphins are a little bit more of a, a reason to, to push yourself that much farther, to, to stretch your legs that much harder and reach up that much higher, um, to reach the goal that it is that the therapists are trying to reach because Let's face it, Alphonse is much more fun to hang out with than a doctor. Trainer Robbie has been working with Sebastian for three weeks now, with today their last session together. I've seen some amazing progress in uh, just, just his muscular movements that Tina's been working on. And he formed an incredible bond with Alphonse. Uh, with a personality like his, it's, it's expected, you know. Alphonse has sensed Sebastian's condition from the outset and has been responding to his patient's every move. He 
has improved a lot over the last three weeks that we have been here because he has problems with his balance and his uh, sensitive motor control and now I, I really see a difference. So he's really moving, he's walking much much better than before we came and also his uh, sensitive control has changed a lot. Sebastian's mother Petra has followed her son's every improvement and that of many other youngsters. But you can see it yourself. I mean, with all the children here, that it's just something is happening, definitely. Even though there is no real explanation, but there is something happening. And that's the most important thing. For the dolphins, the end of yet another session is an opportunity to let loose. For the center's founder, Dr. Nathanson, dolphins, as a means of healing the sick and disabled, are a proven success story. Of every 100 of his patients they swim with, 95 have shown discernible improvements in their condition. I don't know if it's a mystical power. It sometimes appears that way, and that's okay, because I don't have an answer for that. Uh, I choose to try and interpret it in a more scientific way, but certainly the result is the same, meaning that we see how, how gentle the dolphins are with the kids, how much they like the kids. For Jeffrey Mason, the psychoanalyst, what's happening is extremely powerful. I would have to say, it's, from our point of view, it is a miracle. I think the dolphins, hey, no big deal. We've been doing this forever. You just forgot to watch. Of course, the parents say, my God, he's never done this. I've never seen this before. This is a miracle. And for the child, too, the child must feel, what is happening to me? Some miracle is taking place. Something having to do with love, something having to do with compassion, something having to do with being understood for the first time. If dogs are man's best friend, think of how indispensable they are for many disadvantaged people. As we're about to see, these days, dogs are actively helping people in a whole range of ways. They're such great gurus, says Jeffrey Mason, they can teach all of us how to live. It means to live right now, to smell what you smell, to see what you see, to have your friends near you. That's the ultimate joy and the meaning of life. We can only learn the meaning of life from dogs like Astro. Certainly Bruno here has given new meaning to Jocelyn Tack's life. Jocelyn was born severely deaf and unable to hear sounds the rest of us take for granted. Bruno, a 10-year-old Labrador cross, has been formally trained to help alert her to sounds she can't hear. The training takes place at a special facility, Hearing Dogs for Deaf People, an hour's drive from West London. This organization has helped train more than a thousand dogs for severely or profoundly deaf people all over the United Kingdom. One of the trainers is Lisa Coles, working with a six-year-old Spaniel cross called Samba, there's lots of sounds, anything from two or three sounds up to 12 sounds. Doorbells, cooker timers, calls, telephones, smoke alarms, fire bells, baby cries. There's lots of different sounds, the general everyday sounds that go off in the home, really. First on the training agenda is having the dog alert its trainer about a ringing telephone. <laughs> what is it? Good girl, that's better. Good girl. Well, what we do is we just um, set the sounds off and reward the dogs for coming and touching us when they hear the sound. Once the dog alerts the trainer, it's trained to lead them back to the telephone where the dog is rewarded. There are also situations where the owner needs to be alerted but not led back to the source of the sound. Situations like fire bells and smoke alarms. Basically, when Samba hears this, I wouldn't want her to lead me anywhere. She's going to touch me, I'm going to ask her what is it, and she's going to drop to the floor. So let's see what happens, see if she performs for us. So she's telling me, what is this? There we go, good girl. As for the type of dogs best suited to helping deaf people... They have to want to be with people. They have to be good in all sorts of situations, with children, other animals, in, on public transport, that sort of thing. Come here, you, cheeky. Um, and they have to want to do the work because it's all very motivational based. Bruno? Certainly, they are characteristics that Bruno enjoys. His owner, Jocelyn, has been severely deaf since birth and has had Bruno for the past eight years. 
I realised after I got married and uh, left home that um, I did rely on other people around me for this sound and that's when I decided that it would be ideal to um, apply for a dog. Um, Bruno's given me much more confident and independent and um, people have a lot more time to spend with me when I have problems in shops and hearing sound. Bruno's duties begin first thing every morning. When Jocelyn's alarm clock goes off, it's Bruno's job to wake her. He was equally as helpful when her children were young. When the, uh, the baby alarm was switched on, Bruno would um, alert me when the little one started to cry. Once she's up, Bruno acts as her ears for sounds she would otherwise miss. A visitor pressing the doorbell just wouldn't be heard. With Bruno on the job, she knows there's someone calling and is able to meet them. But for Jocelyn, Bruno is more than her ears. He's super sensitive to her in so many subtler ways. You know, if I'm not feeling brilliant, and the same with him if he's not feeling 100%, um, yeah, there is a sixth sense. Um, I don't know how I to describe it. You just know he's just a part of me, really. He's the um, other half. <laughs> Imagine the bond that exists between these Lipizzaner stallions and their riders. Both have trained together for years for this performance of the Spanish Riding School in Vienna the culmination of hours of practice every day and a deep and sensitive understanding of one another. Horses, as we're about to see, are even more sensitive when it comes to disabled people. Jan Pike has congenital cerebral palsy and yet, with the aid of an 18-year-old purebred Arabian stallion known as Nimaya, she's able to move like never before. I think that the horses have been in compassion, especially me, okay? Good. Jan has been riding for 20 years and has just been selected to ride for Australia in the World Championships for Disabled Riders, their equivalent of the Olympic Games. Well, it's fantastic. It's great, it really is. It's just a, an awesome feeling. It's a, Taylor and you. Trainer Gil Rickards believes Jan's riding is now so good for her disability that she could win a medal at the championships. Good. Much of that improvement can be attributed to Niemeyer. I believe they do have a sixth sense. Uh, you see it on their face when the rider first gets on. Uh, it's a Empathy that the horse feels for the rider. Geoffrey Mason believes horses like Nimaya have been helping people for a long, long time. The horse knows everything. It's astonishing. It's very much like with dolphins. These horses, whom we've used simply to carry us from one place to another for the last, what, 6,000 years, we've never recognized that they have a sensitivity greater than our sensitivity. So they know when they are carrying a disabled child, they know they can't do the kinds of things they do with a professional rider. And they're careful. They step gingerly. They, they are feeling compassion for that child. And that's something we didn't recognize that horses felt, compassion for our species. Certainly, Nimaya is displaying great compassion for Jan today as she prepares to fly halfway across the world to the championships in Belgium. Well, I'm going to try and do my absolute best. Belgium is the scene of the World Dressage Championships for people with a disability. Riders with all manner of disabilities have come from as far as China and Japan, with excitement building as the three-day contest gets underway. This is awesome. Among the disabilities, there are riders like Jan Roos from the Czech Republic. Jan has been visually impaired since he suffered leukemia as a young boy, and yet, even though he can't see where he's going, he's able to guide his horse around the arena with superb grace and precision. He's guided by team leader 
Hanna Masova. This test uh, I learned with him one year. One year. Yes, we have prepared for World Championship one year. What Jan has memorized over that year of training is the exact position of the people wearing letters. Hannah calls the letter he's to move to next, and as he's approaching, that person calls out their letter. His horse is a very good, very good horse. Uh, he is uh, 14 years old. Uh, the name of the horse is uh, Carino. Another rider of enormous talent and sheer grit is Bettina Eistel. Born without arms, Bettina has overcome her disability by using her mouth and feet. She's able to place the saddle and bridle on, then buckle up without any assistance. And she does it all with a great sense of pride. I, I don't fi find it difficult, <laughs> too difficult to ride, because uh, I have no arms all my life. So, <laughs> so I can't say how difficult is it, it, it is with arms. <laughs> Riding for Germany in the competition, Bettina cuts an impressive figure as she guides her horse through a series of formations. I ride him with feeling and uh, joy and with my legs, and I have the, the reins in my mouth, the upper reins, and the uh, second uh, pair of reins on my feet. And again, like Jan, the visually impaired man, her horse senses her disadvantages and responds superbly. He's a very sensible horse, and it's just a fun and joy <laughs> to ride him. We are partner. He's my dancing partner. But it's like dancing <laughs> to music, <laughs> really. We have contact, really close contact. And I feel all the thoughts he, he think I feel in my legs. So, and, and he feel all uh, the, the feelings uh, I have. It's a very close relationship. It's been a wonderful display of riding skills, and Bettina has every reason to hope for a medal. Thanks, she says, to her companion. He uh, don't sense whether I have her arms or not, but he sends uh, who I am and how I, I handle him. So. He always gives uh, an uh, when I come into the stable, and <laughs> so we know each other very good. <laughs> then it's Jan Pike's turn. She and her horse have just four minutes to perform before the judges, riding in a category for the most severely disabled people. Her mantra has been to remain as calm and relaxed as possible. Totally focused on the test. Um, my horse is just absolutely wonderful. Jan has been practicing these steps for years. Hers is a study of concentration as she steers her horse through a series of maneuvers. It's good, very good. But she does have a momentary lapse. I dropped one in the rain um, halfway and I had trouble getting it back up again. Despite that, her horse responds intuitively to her guiding Jan through a performance that is still world-class for her disability. Later in the stables, Jan is given her score. 66, 42. Mm. Mm. Yeah. 66 isn't bad. I would have liked a little bit of that. <laughs> the culmination of years of training and three days of intense international competition is the award ceremony. Bettina Eistel's performance has earned her a silver medal, and she's justifiably beaming with pride. And then, the Class 1 winners. Jan Pike's name is called out, and she too has collected a silver medal. They may have a distinctly different nature to that of a dog or a dolphin, but even cats can help disadvantaged people. So too can other domestic pets like rabbits or guinea pigs. We're following all three as they're taken to the Exceptional Children's Foundation in Culver City, California. Their owners have all volunteered to help an organization known as Create a Smile, and that's exactly what the animals do. 
bring a smile as wide as the Grand Canyon to the faces of the people who handle them. Sandra's reaction to touching a giant French rabbit says it all. They're just so excited about the animals. It's just something about it. You know, the, I, I, I can't really explain it. Is that the guinea pig? Oh, the interaction is just phenomenal. Once a week, the volunteers bring their pets, the building erupting in spontaneous laughter every time. Krista Barrett's pet guinea pig is always a big hit. I believe they have exude unconditional love. And then these, these people, they feel it. They really feel it. And you can see this. He's so calm with her, and, and, and he's so <laughs> loving with her. And, and you can't put up a barrier with that. Yeah, I like that. It's nice. I like that. The human-to-human -human interaction has so many obstacles, and with animals there are none. I think that animals are able to, um, to really identify what's needed in a human soul and give that back. Volunteer Claudette Atkins has seen similar responses with her giant rabbit. They're just very calming to, to um, people when they go in. If there's somebody a little hyper or a little um, stressed out, you can see that a rabbit is just kind of very calming. They can pet them. They're very soft. Create a Smile has been formed on the very basis that animals do heal people with Georgia Whitlock leading the volunteers today. I think it, the animals have total unconditional love for the clients and the patrons that they visit. They don't see um, any of their disabilities or anything. They just have total unconditional love for these people that we visit. Back in Australia, farmyard animals are playing a role in helping sick children recover. At the Children's Hospital in Westmead, Sydney, a regular visit from the Kindy Farm has become an essential part of the children's therapy program. Nurse Sharon Hunt says all her children benefit from interacting with the animals. I think they're definitely happier. They love coming down and seeing the animals and playing with the animals and happy children are healthier children and it makes them probably heal a bit quicker, get them out of here a bit quicker. It's got to be beneficial to their health in the long term to be able to do things like this, without a doubt. One of the children who love the animal visits is Daniel Staunton. They're really kind and relaxing. And when you're in hospital, you don't want to be sitting up there in your boring old room. You want to get out here and enjoy yourself with those cute little animals, like Bugs Bunny here. Well, as they're cute and beautiful, they just help you sort of figure out different ways to get better. Daniel's mother, Cheryl, agrees wholeheartedly. I think it's definitely helping. Um, they say um, that animals um, help recovery of people, and, and I think it's definitely helping Daniel with, you know, being able to interact with all the different programs and the animals. One man who's witnessed hundreds of children benefiting from the farmyard animals is the man who brings them to the hospital, Bryce Chapman. I think um, anything like laugh therapy or animal therapy distracts the children from where they are. Um, I'm not exactly sure what scientific reasoning is behind it, but it does. It really helps the children out. We've seen some, um, some amazing results of children actually getting quite a lot better as a result of kidney farms visits. Geoffrey Mason has witnessed animal-led recoveries all over the world. Suddenly something is transformed in that child. Now, I think partly it's a memory of when they were able to enjoy this. Partly it's also the complete innocence of this. Here's something in front of them that is asking nothing from them. It's not demanding anything from them. And it gives them a kind of joy. I think it really is joy. Back across the Pacific Ocean to Los Angeles, another group of sick children, this time at a Salvation Army facility, are being visited by the three volunteers with their cat, guinea pig, and giant rabbit. Once again, their pets stir the emotions, with Create a Smile organizer Georgia Whitlock witnessing many transformations. We had one little boy who apparently only speaks a couple times a week who actually said, I want to hold it, regarding the guinea pig. Was very excited. So why do the pets trigger such a positive response in humans? You know, I wish I knew what it was exactly, but I can't explain it. It's something that you have to see, that you have to experience, 
and you see the difference it makes in the children and in individuals when we do make a visit. It's something very, very special and something you don't forget once you see it. Not too far from the glitz of Hollywood, another training operation is underway. Here, dogs are being trained by an organization known as Canine Assistance Dogs to help people with disabilities. Dexter, a two-year-old German Shepherd Collie, has already learned basic skills around the house. Refrigerator. Trainer Sarah Prell first taught Dexter to open the fridge door, then retrieve items inside. Water. A lot of people can't do that. A lot of people can't go to their fridge. A lot of people can't pull it. They may be able to shut it, but they can't use their strength to do that. So um, getting, doing simple things like water or well, some people keep their medicine bag in there and he can also go in there and get that out and bring their medication to them. Everyday chores are taught, like retrieving the laundry basket. Come on, 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 get it. He already has that pulling technique down, um, so we're, we're trying to get him to walk with it. And selecting clothes to be washed. He's learning to, to put them in here, to actually put them into the laundry basket. So he's helping me, we're helping each other. He's not doing all of the work himself. Pull. The most important tasks will require Dexter to help his disabled pull, pull, pull. carer move around the house. Many disabled persons, their, their strength comes and goes. Um, persons with multiple sclerosis or Parkinson's disease at times feel weaker than other times. So if, if they're feeling that way, they can give the dog a command and he will help them to their feet. In a real emergency, where the carer has collapsed, for instance, Dexter is taught to activate an emergency telephone call. Basically, when the dog hits the yellow button, it will uh, trigger this phone to dial up to eight different numbers, and it will continue dialing them until somebody picks up. Such is the demand for assistance dogs that there's a two-year waiting list, with dogs taking up to six months to train. Dogs like Dexter are familiarized with a range of everyday activities, like helping their carers through a shopping mall. The dogs will be taught to give them support. Perfect. I put, I'm almost pushing all my weight on him, so he did really good. Helping people stand up again is another skill. Um, I'm going to use him to pull myself out of the chair, uh, using the bar on his harness to push myself out of the chair. And his job is to just stay still and, and hold tight. Dexter will be taught to ignore distractions. It's important to expose Dexter to all types of distractions, like these flipping dogs. And he'll be called on to pick up items like banknotes dropped by his carer. I'm going to drop something. Um, a lot of times people waiting in line, they'll pull their money out, they'll drop it. If, they, if uh, A lot of people that um, have certain diseases, when they bend over, the blood rushes to their head and they can pass out. So I'm going to drop this. Dexter, bring. Bring. Good. These dogs are not only helping their owners to cope with physical tasks, they're so sensitive, they're giving tremendous emotional support as well. Over in Australia, assistance dogs are being trained to help disabled people, like 23-year-old Tanya Sutton. She's suffering from cerebral palsy, with Bonnie, the golden retriever, her four-legged helper. She understands stuff. That no one else understands. Fine. Good job. Tap. Bonnie's always there for her, helping Tanya change her clothes, for instance. The dog knows exactly what is required of her, tugging gently to remove Tanya's outer clothing. Bonnie's senses are so finely tuned that she'll automatically pick up items that Tanya has dropped. And like Dexter we saw being trained in California, Bonnie will tug a rope attached to the fridge door when Tanya feels like a drink. One of the things Tanya has wanted to achieve is to study at university.
She's now halfway to becoming a Bachelor of Aboriginal Health Science and Community Development, with Bonnie at her side as she travels around the campus. Here, tasks such as pressing the elevator button are fulfilled by Bonnie. And Bonnie is there when it comes to dropping off assignments. Meeting with lecturers. Come on, Bonnie. And going to the canteen. A task normal people would think nothing of, like paying for some candy, is undertaken by Bonnie. She's made my life a lot more easier. Mummy loves you, don't you? They're an absolute joy, these Labrador Retriever puppies, doling out unconditional love like there's no tomorrow. Labradors are a very special kind of dog in anyone's books, smart and ever so eager to please. And as they grow, some become even more special than others, those labs selected to help guide visually impaired people. At Glossodia, on the western outskirts of Sydney, the Centre for Guide Dogs of New South Wales has been training thousands of dogs with Chief Trainer Anne Fagerlund. We're looking for a temperamentally sound dog and a dog that's healthy as well. So we'll test its, its eyes and its hips and make sure that it's, it meets the criteria in that area. And we're looking for a dog that can walk down a street and, and ignore all the distractions that it might encounter. The Labradors being trained today are both seven months old. Kayla, a black lab, and Nicola, her golden companion. Labradors um, are universally well used around the world because they're adaptable. It might sound funny, but they come in different colours and different sizes, which is really important for the, for the people out there that we help get around the environment. They're a breed that very quickly change their loyalty from one person to another. Not every dog selected for training goes on to help the visually impaired. Good boys. Good boys. About half of them are dropped because their temperament is not quite right. With this group we started with about 25, 24 dogs um, and we're down to 14. And it's looking that all those 14 should make it through at this stage. The best part of the dog's training takes them out into the community. Every day Anne and her assistant drive a number of the dogs in training to the closest shopping centre where they learn their guiding skills. First, they'll be taught to lead their visually impaired carer along the footpath, avoiding all obstacles. Find your way. That's a good boy. When they're walking along here, basically, they just concentrate on, on the job at hand, and that's just to walk in a straight line and to get to each down curve and then work from that basis. So we're encouraging them to ignore all those distractions. The distractions that Anne speaks of could be other dogs. Or it could be the temptation of the meat on display in the butcher's shop. The dogs are disciplined to lead on without straying. Then there are the life or death skills, such as stopping before crossing roads. Stairs provide another challenge. It's all part of a training regime that, once mastered, sees them allocated to the person best suited and most in need of them. Well done. One very happy graduate of the guide dog's training camp is Khan, an adorable four-year-old golden retriever who's been allocated to Joe Weir. I love animals and I do feel I have a, a special connection with animals. Jo has been visually impaired since she was a teenager and was severely restricted with where she could go and what she could do until Khan came along. I cannot fathom what, what life was like without him. He's, uh, he's changed my life quite dramatically and um, I just adore him. He really is just so beautiful. Aren't you mate, hey? You're gorgeous. I do love you. Khan and Jo have been together for the past two years. 
the bond between Khan and I is so strong now that I can't imagine um, doing anything without him. And because of that, that strength of that bond, there's things that I can do with Khan by my side that I would never have dreamt that I could ever do. Joe believes Khan is both super smart and very intuitive. I believe Khan very much knows that I have a disability and he knows that that is that I can't see. And he knows that it is his job to get me safely from one place to another. Um, and he definitely knows that he's working when he's wearing his harness. He's like having two dogs really, one a working dog and one a pet dog. As soon as I put that harness on, he knows that he's got a job to do and he's very good at it. One activity that Joe and Khan share is running a farm in the Southern Highlands of New South Wales. Khan is really fantastic at getting me around the property. He's been trained to actually get me to certain destinations, like from the house to the shed. He knows how to get into each of the individual paddocks. He knows how to get me to the water, and he knows how to get me to the hay pile so I can feed the um, alpacas. Joe only recently took over her new property, but already Khan is showing her around. It's really lovely having Khan being able to do this because I don't have to focus on following fence lines. I can get there a lot quicker, a lot more direct, and I feel a lot safer when I'm out and about walking with Khan. The animals that Jo has chosen to breed on her farm are alpacas. Where are you all? Hello! She wanted an animal that could be bred as a pet. Now she has to train the alpacas and Khan to accept one another. Khan and the alpacas have a very interesting relationship. Basically, Khan, being a dog, is a predator, and the alpacas are prey animals. So I've had to work very hard to get them used to each other and comfortable in each other's presence. And um, now I'm happy to say Khan will walk right past the fence of alpacas without even really noticing they're there. And thankfully, the alpacas don't seem to be paying too much attention to him either, which is just fantastic. Come on, find the hay. Good boy. Good boy. That's it. Joe's new routine means she has to handle every aspect of caring for the alpacas. Mush, mush, that's it. Once a day, she'll herd them from one paddock to another. They're lovely creatures, they're curious, they're gentle, they're easy to handle, and they each have their unique personality, which I really enjoy about an, an, an animal, is getting to know each of them individually and working out the best way to train them and what they like and what they don't like. So alpacas was the perfect choice. Joe has had to learn the identity of each alpaca by feeling the tag attached to its ear. It's coated with braille. She's also learning to attach a halter to each of the alpacas so she can lead them. One of her favorites is Fantasia. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna work on training Fantasia today. And Fantasia is a fairly large alpaca. She's got a dark body and a white face, so I can probably pick her out by finding the heads. And I think this might be her here. Yes, hello, darling. Now we feel her nose, find out where her nose is. Put the last. Tighten it up. Fantasia's come a long way with her leading um, in the last three to four weeks when, since I've been working with her. Um, I started off initially by just rewarding her for standing still, and her reward, what she really responds to, is a little bit of food. That's it. One essential task for Jo yeah, is to check the health of the alpacas. Yeah, Several times a month, she'll inspect their teeth, Good boy. then feel their legs and hooves yep, for any no, problems. I honestly feel that my animals, um, they do know that there is something special about me, and they certainly seem to respond better to me than they do my husband, for example. We do have a very special connection. Good boy. Undoubtedly, the most difficult chore is giving an injection to the alpacas. He needs a shot of antibiotics every day um, to help him beat the infection. So I have to give him one of these every day. He doesn't much like it, I don't much like it, but it needs to be done. OK, matey, come on. The biggest challenge facing Joe today is to bring the alpacas and Khan together. There you go. Khan has to resist a lot of his natural urges to focus on doing his job, which is keeping me safe and not worrying about what the alpacas are doing. And he does a great job at that, so he's a good boy. 
As for the animal's ability to help and heal her, that special bond you have between you and your animals, the way that they can make you feel, the way that they make you spiritually complete is really quite miraculous. He feel all uh, the, the feelings uh, I have. It's a very close relationship. It's something that you have to see, that you have to experience. He's just a part of me, really. He's the um, other half. <laughs> my brain says there's no magic. My heart says it's absolutely magical. Something is happening, definitely. Even though there is no real explanation, but there is something happening.